Hi, we are now going to discuss the chapter 3 which is input output devices. As you are aware there are a whole range of uh, input and output devices. These are fundamentally devices which enable human computer interaction and there are a whole range of it. Some of them we have listed here. For example, on the input device side you have the more familiar keyboard, mouse, touch screens, scanners and tablets, joysticks, MICR and including the barcodes that we write on checks for example. But there's many more and there are fancier devices for example when you look at gaming devices the kind of devices you get including hand gestures which are used in the V uh, kind of uh, uh, gaming devices. And on the output devices you find the more familiar uh, monitors and printers and uh, plotters which are typically used in the engineering side of it. Let's look at each one of them and the basic characteristics of input devices and how do they work because as a manager finally what I need to understand is uh, what is the device, how does it work, what are the principles behind uh, the operation of that device and uh, as a buyer what should I look for. So the merits, demerits and the specifications that I typically look for while buying such a device. The key characteristics of both input and output devices could be summarized in the following manner. One is the speed at which you can read or write depending on whether it's input or output. The character set uh, which is to say that what kind of characters is it capable of reading or what kind of characters can it display or print. Uh, is it the alphabets, is it numerals, numerals or is it a mix of those or is it graphics that it can print. The fidelity and resolution, particularly resolution is something which we are familiar with as a term. How reliably is the device able to represent the character in its correct form? So for example, in a typical printout you might notice that an A does not look like a clear A but it's actually a series of dots which seem to be joined. It's just that the dots are close enough that we don't realize that there is a gap in between each dot. Now, High resolution therefore in that context means that if the dots are packed so close to each other there's practically no gap in between and you see a continuous line uh, emerging on the screen or on the printer. Then you have the local storage. Most of these devices tend to have some storage because as we discussed earlier the speeds of the physical and electromechanical devices tend to be much slower compared to the speed at which let's say the computer works and therefore a large amount of data is pumped out of the computer into the uh, devices or vice versa which therefore needs to be buffered in between. There, there's a great speed match between you know we are talking of nanoseconds of memory speed versus milliseconds of uh, secondary storage devices or maybe a milliseconds of uh, speed at which uh, these other devices work and to fill in that gap you need a buffer. Uh, it also frees up the main computer once it has dumped the output for example to a printer and the printer's buffer uh, takes up the data and at its own speed prints it. And there are a whole lot of other user friendly features that we expect out of these devices because these are devices primarily meant for human interaction and therefore it has to keep in mind the human focus in terms of accessibility, usage, security and a whole range of other features which you might expect. Size is the other important thing and portability, size and weight for example. Now increasingly we are looking at say a laptop and you are carrying a laptop long but then the external hard disk that you have which goes along with it, it should be equally lightweight that you can easily carry with you. Uh, looking at keyboard, a keyboard is a very old fashioned device but it still survives and primarily because it is the most natural form of input that we have learned from the typewriter days to today. and Keyboards are actually nothing but a continuation of the typewriter format in terms of what they call as the quality standard which people are so familiar with in terms of typing and uh, makes it that much more easier. But in principle the way it works is every key that you press actually is nothing but a switch and it makes a connection in internally to generate a uh, particular digital signal which can then be encoded into an ASCII format which is sent into the computer. The keyboard also therefore has a buffer for the simple reason that your typing speed will be different and it accepts all the characters and then buffers it and pushes it into the computer at a certain uh, rate. The only demerit is it is of course subjected to your own typing speed. So obviously it will be limited till let us say 40 words per minute or whatever that you type. 
the mouse is the other device and mouse is obviously used as a means of pointing so when the new generation of computers came as we discussed the fourth generation of computers essentially the ability to look at gui or graphical user interface brought in the importance of mouse because now you're not typing something but you're actually pointing to something on the screen the mouse is a device which translates movement of the hand into corresponding uh, location on the screen a tracker ball is essentially exactly in principle the same as a mouse the difference being that it's an inverted mouse and you move the ball physically which enables you to control the cursor on the screen uh, typically on laptops you would find uh, tracker balls and you could move them uh, to control the uh, location of the cursor just to show you how it looks and this is the inverted uh, look of a mouse and you find the ball which rolls across the surface and the direction and the speed decides uh, where exactly the cursor would be the tracker ball is essentially as i said exactly the opposite of that it detects uh, the movement of your finger on the ball and rotates the ball and Uh, sends uh, those x y directions back to the cursor control the advantage is that it occupies less space because you would have noticed that sometimes on a small desk it's very difficult to find enough space to move around the mouse whereas tracker ball is something which is fitted into the uh, system itself and virtually occupies no space at all the other in- output device uh, is uh, the monitor the most a uh, popular one which we use and monitors come in variety of and of course there's a history of evolution of monitors as well based on the technology which is used to build the monitors it's almost the same as we have seen on televisions for example right from the cathode ray based television screens the black and white to the color and now you're talking about plasma and such things so almost the same uh, evolution seems to have uh, hit the it world in terms of the output device on the monitor Uh, the various display technologies that have uh, we've seen a uh, cathode ray technology the liquid crystal display the lcd as we call it the plasmas and the thin film uh, transistors and so on here's an example of a crt tube a conventional uh, cathode ray tube as we understand it it's uh, nothing but an electromagnetic device which generates electrons and beams them uh, to generate those three primary colors which are displayed finally on the screen now the limitation of this obviously as we've seen is a power consumption b is in terms of uh, the size itself you would have seen that the earlier televisions that we used to have at home used to have a huge bulk behind because of the si- that the kind of design of the cathode ray tube and need to occupy that and as opposed to what we get today which is absolutely a flat screen kind of a device uh scanner is the other important device which we use for input and uh, the basic principle of a scanner is essentially almost similar to how you use a xerox machine where it actually scans uh, the surface of the uh, document and picks up uh, all the uh, dots which appear on the uh, paper and translate them into uh, a digitized format various types of scanners which are available uh, primarily the flat bed where the, there's a flat surface on which you keep the paper and the scanner moves uh, across it the sheet fed where the sheet moves through the scanner and is read and the fourth is a handheld scanner for example you would have seen in a retail store sometimes where you have those handheld scanners uh, to read the barcodes on uh, devices so you could have scanning devices of that kind as well so in fact you get some advertisements which talk about a pen which also has a scanner for example so this is an example of a scanner and uh, how there's a roller which moves on top of the paper and reads it now the technologies used could vary but uh, i think here's an example of a charge coupled device which basically uh, picks up uh, the uh, light Uh, which is displayed by a lens which reflects from the paper and back into the ccd or the charge coupled device this is converted into a, a digital signal which is sent back and recorded S- scanners of course one of the things that you look for is uh, the resolution as we see for all output and input devices but uh, for example if uh, you were wanting to scan a photograph obviously you need a high resolution 
but if you were just scanning uh, sort of a simple diagram then you wouldn't probably bother so much about resolutions. So both for laser printers as well as for scanners we typically talk about dots per inch uh, as one of the measures of uh, the sharpness, the measure of uh, the uh, resolution as such. The other thing to remember is where you have particularly a paper uh, movement involved. There's a risk that like in other printers the paper can get jammed and such things. So sometimes you might actually prefer a flatbed uh, device because you can just leave the paper there and the device moves on top of it and scans it. Touch screen is uh, increasingly becoming popular in various areas particularly where direct uh, lay people are interacting with it, makes life easier. You just have symbols there or icons and you're expected to click on that and get the action uh, done through it. Now how does it work? Basically it's a screen which has two layers, one which is a sensitive layer and the other which is just a covering. The minute you touch the top screen it uh, sort of creates a uh, uh, trigger in terms of a, uh, electron being generated and that gets collected behind in terms of an electric current. Now these are activations which we can do between the uh, top screen and the screen below it which is a more sensitive screen. Now there are two fundamental uh, technologies behind it, one what you call as capacitive and one which is uh, resistive and uh, capacitive obviously seems to be better in terms of uh, the amount of light it actually transfers and therefore you get a uh, better uh, uh, or a sharper uh, impact the place you touch. Otherwise some could be a little uh, uh, fuzzy and therefore makes it uh, difficult to assess as to where exactly you need to press to activate the screen. So you'll find a huge, huge type of uh, variety that's available in terms of touch screens. You would have seen some of them available for example on bank ATMs and such things. And these are some of the technologies that we use uh, behind it, so analog resistive or capacitive or you have uh, scanning infrared or you have surface acoustic waves etc. Printers, this is one broad area which uh, we need to discuss and uh, there are two broad types of printers available. One is what you call as impact printers where there is a physical impact between the read write head and the paper and the non-impact printers where from a distance uh, the ink or an appropriate uh, medium is transferred to the paper. Now in the impact variety you will find the more popular ones we've seen in the past are dot matrix printers and daisy wheel and line printers. Of course some of them are historical now because we largely believe in using uh, laser printers increasingly these days. But dot matrix have really served uh, most of the industry for a long time and particularly for all data processing needs for all office use and they are very reliable printers which basically believe in forming dots on a print head and uh, the pins uh, hit onto the surface of the paper transferring the ink onto the paper. Daisy wheel is a kind of a wheel which already has characters uh, built onto the wheel itself and it uh, hits onto the paper to transfer the uh, ink pretty much like a typewriter actually. And line printers are where an entire line is composed uh, in memory first and then transferred in terms of uh, movement of uh, character set onto the uh, uh, band and once the band is composed uh, very much like the good old printing days where we had to actually compose every line and then uh, frame it and then put it. Here it's just about not the whole page but at least one line at a time is composed and transferred which hits onto the paper and transfers the uh, line content with of course a ribbon in between. So uh, these are the more conventional uh, ways of printing. Now one of the problems with these kind of printers have been of course uh, the speed at which they operate because impact means that there will be a uh, sort of a time required to hit and come back and move. So therefore these are slower printers. For example when you talk of dot matrix printers we typically talk about uh, number of uh, let, let's say characters per second whereas when you talk of line printers which were traditionally the faster variety of printers and for large scale data processing for instance I am printing a lack of share warrants then maybe a line printer is still what is required and we are talking about 600 lines per minute or you are talking about 1000 lines per minute etc. 
So you get fairly fast speeds of uh, printing in such cases. Now obviously one of the issues with uh, all these printers is the uh, uh, quality sometimes was not as good particularly in case of dot matrix because dot matrix believes in having multiple pins and there are uh, these pins will obviously have gaps because they are mechanically constructed and this gap leads to the resolution error, uh, issue which I spoke about. So you don't get a clean line but you rather get a uh, series of dots which are fairly close enough to make sense of the letter that is being printed. Line printers however could be if they are not made in the same style as a dot matrix then they could be a little better because you could actually have a completely formed uh, character of metal etched onto the band itself and once you've composed the band and you hit it you might get a good quality printout. But the speed uh, makes it very difficult to guarantee a quality of that kind. On the other hand you have non-impact printers and some of the varieties that we have seen uh, historically things like uh, uh, inkjet and you have uh, many of the thermal printers which we use for example on the ATM you get that small uh, transaction slip. All these are examples of uh, thermal printers that are used with dye sublimation or any other technology. Uh, then you have uh, laser printers which are very popular and for obvious reasons because they are capable of actually printing a high quality and it is actually almost like a Xerox machine, complete transfer of an image, digitizing it and printing it back onto the uh, uh, surface. Uh, just to get into the laser printer a little bit, uh, here's an example of a laser printer and you'll see uh, that it looks almost like akin to a Xerox machine actually. So there is a uh, printer which has a drum inside and if we see the drum assembly, uh, you'll find the paper rolls in and as the paper rolls in there's a transfer, the reverse transfer exactly like opposite of a scanner where uh, you have the digitized content getting converted into an image on the drum. The drum itself could be a selenium drum with pretty much similar to your uh, Xerox machine. And the photoreceptors which actually transfer uh, this information. An inkjet printer simply sprays ink from a distance and that is the difference. So uh, whereas uh, you have seen in the dot matrix printer uh, you have a physical contact here from a slight distance without hitting the paper, you spray ink onto it. Now this makes uh, one of the biggest benefits of uh, these non-impact printers, whether it's laser or whether it's inkjet is that they virtually make no noise and which is a great boon in an office environment because you can imagine if a, a, a line printer for example blasting at thousand uh, lines per minute makes a huge amount of noise. So typically you would find in large data centers you would have these uh, expensive line printers typically put under a cubicle or a cabin so that the uh, noise does not transmit outside. Many of these printer devices are actually uh, supported by stepper motors for the simple reason that you need to move the paper, move the uh, head, um, some movement is involved and stepper motor is a technology fundamentally used for this movement. This is just an assembly of uh, the electronics that goes behind the inject printer. And uh, one important thing about all input output devices is uh, where they connect and uh, port is as we said is a place where uh, an external device can hook on to a computer. And various types of ports are involved but I think the most popular now is the USB port. Uh, so we've had of course in the past uh, ports like the parallel ports where printers were traditionally connected. Then some of the printers, uh, particularly the portable ones started to connect to the serial port. But now almost every printer is actually connected to a USB port which has become a standard for most small devices and including servers actually. Uh, the thermal printers uh, as we have discussed is uh, uh, something which we typically use where you have a pre-prepared paper of some kind and it could be chemically coated paper where either because of heat or because of uh, a light burning into it, various technologies involved which make it possible to create or etch so to speak uh, letters and characters onto it. So you find for example increasingly now either on ATMs or maybe you look at a petrol pump where they generate those uh, bills automatically. Uh, those are bills which actually don't, one limitation of this thermal uh, printing is that 
it fades away with time. So if you need, for example, to get your bill subsequently approved uh, for payment, then you might want to keep that bill and to preserve that becomes difficult. So maybe you have to Xerox it and just for uh, retaining it for some time. Uh, but other than that, they are uh, uh, they make life easy because you can have small printers installed on a variety of devices and uh, for online payment or on the spot payment kind of devices. One other device which we have to look at is uh, the webcam, and it's a one versatile device. You know, which uh, you use it either on, let's say you have a webcam built into your uh, uh, laptop, or you have a separate device which you just hook onto the laptop. Why would you do that? A, of course, is that you want to probably do a video chat with somebody or you're connecting on Skype and wanting to speak to somebody abroad. Now, these are becoming very common things that people want to do. And therefore, you need a device which captures the image of the person in front and transfers it uh, through the computer back uh, on the network. Now, therefore, you have a simple device called a webcam. There's a photograph here showing what a webcam is. Of course, we're familiar with it. And then you connect it on a USB port typically and that transfers, it captures and transfers information back to uh, the computer. Uh, one important thing when you look at uh, cameras of any kind and that's true of the webcam is, is the kind of frame rate that it has. How many frames can it capture in a given time? And the, the, it has a certain pre-designed interval at which it captures. So it's sort of a sampling uh, mechanism. And uh, if you want to really do video streaming, for example, you need a fairly high rate of uh, uh, transfer or capture, which is something like 15 frames per second or 30 frames per second could be even better. And uh, webcams, one, one of the other applications that you've seen increasingly now in offices is for security. For example, all kinds of places you have security cameras posted. Some could be as simple as a webcam. The other popular device which is now, uh, I think we've now stopped talking about computers for that matter and we're actually looking at uh, smartphones as devices which are handheld devices which become uh, easy access devices to the internet and for various other forms of communication. But before the smartphones actually came into place came what we call as the personal digital assistants. They were the precursors of smartphones uh, which were actually a, a thought process coming from the computer industry into trying to create a device which was small. And then you have another uh, trend which is coming from the telecom industry which is trying to create a device which makes things easy to communicate. And a combination of the two therefore uh, led to probably a device that we are now familiar with which is more of a uh, smartphone or a phone based device which also acts as a computer and it has a full fledged computer uh, facility within. Uh, there are other coding methods uh, that we use which also can help us in input or output. One of them is barcodes and you see a whole lot of that in retail. Every box that you buy actually carries a barcode. So what does a barcode look like? So it forms A, it's based on a certain international standard which we call the UPC code. And uh, uh, you see the structure of that which is essentially a 12 digit uh, UPC number which is human readable but at the same time there is a barcode associated with which we can't read which the machine reads directly. One advantage of this is that you can use uh, uh, barcodes as an identification device for a variety of uh, applications and it could not just be limited to retail but could be within a production for example if you want to track a particular item on the shop floor, variety of such uses that you could think of. Libraries, for example, use barcodes extensively. So with that, we come to the end of uh, input output devices, uh, chapter three. Thanks for being with us.